Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, GABA-A receptor mutations and epilepsy. Okay, right, so we are in the process of discussing the structure of the GABA-A receptor. Okay, so we've seen the structure of a subunit of the GABA-A receptor, and I was just going to tell you what the cis loop actually is, so I'll get another piece of paper for this. Right. Okay, so... The cis loop is a loop in the polypeptide structure that is held together through a disulfide bond that is formed between two cysteine amino acids in the opposing strands. So, if I use this line to denote the polypeptide, so this is a polymer of amino acids, then somewhere on this strand you will have a cysteine amino acid like this. Okay, so here's the amino group in the polypeptide. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off it, and here's the R group of the cysteine amino acids, so a methylene group followed by a thiol group, but the thiol group's going to be involved in a disulfide bond. So being fortuitous, I will not draw the hydrogen on that sulfur. Okay, then what will happen is you will bring the polypeptide round like so, it will come up here. So when I've drawn this line here, this actually represents amino acid polymerase to amino acid polymerase to amino acid and onwards. So there are many, many amino acids in this loop. I know I've drawn the cysteine and it looks gigantic compared to the rest of it. But you have to remember that this is amino acid after amino acid after amino acid. So uh, it's not drawn to scale, basically. Okay, so then what you'll have is another cysteine in this opposing strand now here. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon. Here's the methylene group of the R group. And then off the methylene group, you'll then have a thiol group. And you'll have this disulfide bond formed between the two thiol groups. Also off this alpha carbon, you'll have the hydrogen there. And then here's the carboxylic acid group, which will be in a peptide link onwards with this strand. So this is the structure of a cis loop. And this bond here is very important. Okay, So this bond between the two sulfurs. This is the disulfide bond, and this is what's holding together the whole of the cis loop. So this is the disulfide bond, and disulfide bonds are also known as disulfide bridges as well. Okay, so uh, the um, amino acids that are involved in the formation of this disulfide bond, which is holding together the loop, are cysteine amino acids, and the three-letter code for cysteine is CYS. Okay, so that's why this structure is known as a cis loop, uh, because it's a loop in the polypeptide structure which is held together by a disulfide bond between two cysteine amino acids. Okay, so that's the structure of a single subunit of the GABA-A receptor. Now, we need to discuss how GABA-A receptors are actually formed then. Because the really simple thing would be if there was just one gene which coded for this subunit of the GABA-A receptor. Then in order to make a GABA-A receptor, you just had to use this gene five times to make five copies of this protein and then stick them all together. Unfortunately, that simple scenario is not the case. Instead, we have found, so far, 19 genes which all code for subunits of the uh, GABA-A receptor. And you might hopefully say, well, are they all identical? And the answer is no. All of these 19 genes are slightly different. They all have slightly different sequences of organic bases, and they therefore give rise to slightly different sequenced uh, amino well, proteins with slightly different sequences of amino acids. Okay, so basically you have 19 different subunits that you can use to make GABA-A receptors. Now, how do we get some sort of handle on this? Well, we group them into families. So we have the alpha family of GABA-A receptor subunits, which contains six members. The alpha-1 subunit, the alpha-2 subunit, all the way up to the alpha-6 subunit. Then we have the beta family of GABA-A receptor subunits, which contains B1, 
beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Then we have the gamma family of subunits, which contains gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. So, so far, how many genes have we got? We've got these six and these six here, so that makes 12, so we've still got seven to go. Then after this, we've got a gene known as the delta GABA ray receptor subunit, the epsilon GABA ray receptor subunit. Then it gets really funky, the theta GABA ray receptor subunit, and also the pi GABA A receptor subunit. So we're just using Greek letters, okay? Uh, and then finally, that takes us up to how many now? We've got 16, but we need to go to 19, so we need three more. There is then the rho, uh, which is another Greek letter family, which contains row 1, row 2, and row 3. So those are the all of the um, GABA A receptor subunits. Okay, now you might hopefully say, well, this means that we can make 19 GABA A receptors because we can, for each one of these genes, we can uh, make five copies of the protein, stick them all together to make a GABA A receptor. And I would say no, <laughs> N unfortunately not. Basically, that simple scenario where the GABA A receptors are made up of five subunits of the same type is not the case. Instead, you have what are known as heteropentamers, where uh, the subunits which are in all five of the slots are not the same type, basically, heteropentamers. So, what I'm now going to discuss with you is which GABA A receptors are actually important physiologically. Okay, so which are actually expressed to a non-trivial level. Right, so we'll start off with the basic principle. Okay, so the most important GABA A receptors in the human brain all have a general structure. Okay, you, the way that you make them follows a certain rule, okay? So, here are these five separate subunits that we're going to use. So, one, two, three, four, five. So, this is the GABA A receptor seen from above. Okay, I'll move this up. So, the general rule you are going to follow when building a GABA A receptor is that you will go to this collection of subunits. You've got these 19 separate subunits to choose from. What you'll start with is the alpha family. You will pick one from the alpha family. Pick one of those subunits, okay? You will then use that gene to make two of those subunits, okay? And you will stick them in this position and this position, okay? Uh, so I want to stress that these two alpha things that I've drawn here, these two alpha subunits, they are exactly the same one. You cannot have alpha 1 in one and alpha 2 in the other. Whichever one you put in one of these slots will be in the other slot as well. So you pick one alpha gene and you slot it in there. Okay. Now, again, you go to the beta family you pick one of the genes out of the beta family, you use that gene twice to make two identical subunits, and you put them into this position here and this position here. Okay, so I'll denote the beta in this vivid purple colour here. Okay, so, so far, we've only actually used two genes because we've made two identical subunits from each gene. Okay, finally, what you will do is you'll go to the gamma family here, and you'll pick one of those three gamma subunits, and you'll put that in this slot here, okay? So I'll show this in blue here. Right, so that is how you build most of your GABA A receptors that are in your brain. Uh, you take two alpha subunits, which are identical, two beta subunits, which are identical, and a gamma subunit, and you put them together like this. This is two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and a gamma subunit. So most of the GABA A receptors in your brain are obey this formula, basically. There are exceptions, and there are obviously exceptions, because there are loads of genes that would never, ever be included if we only made receptors like this. What would be the point of these bottom uh, seven here? Okay, but 
those ones are more sort of like niche receptors that are built out of those extra synaptic ones and such. We will look at these ones because these are the um, classical ones and the most important ones. Okay, right. So this is the general formula. Let's actually see some actual formulas where I tell you which subunits are going to be used where, but we'll do that in the next video.